welcome back to another episode of the Skiff Travel Podcast with Sarah and Seth. I'm Seth Borko, Skiff's Head of Research. And today, despite the name of the podcast, we're actually not joined by Sarah. She's taken a very well-deserved break in Mexico, where she was just hit by the hurricane barrel storm. So we wish her well. We hope she has the rest of her vacation recovers and that she she can actually enjoy her her very well-deserved time off. But even though I'm the only host today, I am not alone. I'm joined by my wonderful colleagues, Skift Research colleague, Senior Research Analyst, Pranavi Agarwal, as well as Skift Travel Technology Reporter, Justin Dawes. Pranavi, Justin, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. So today we're going to venture forth and we're going to talk about a very popular topic here at Skift. Uh, pun very much intended, we're going to be talking about venture capital. And we have just the right people on the podcast to do it with. Pranavi just published an amazing piece of research called Venture Investment Trends in Travel 2024. It's our landmark annual piece on the state of venture capital in travel, as well as, of course, Justin is our travel technology reporter. He writes a weekly piece on venture trends in the travel industry. Together, they're going to be hosting a LinkedIn Live on this topic. We've got just the right folks. So, um, so thanks so much again for joining us. I'm excited to talk about this topic. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having us. So uh, we're going to start with you, Pranavi. You just published this report on venture investment trends. What I like about this report is that it's kind of method methodologically consistent. It looks at a large venture capital database. We look over many, many years of venture funding in the travel industry. And uh, I think the top line is a little, a little shocking. It shows a pretty big drop. Uh, tell us about that, Pranavi. Yeah, I think the headline kind of chart or the headline message from the report was really that in 2023, venture capital funding into the travel industry hit a decade low of only $2.9 billion of VC investment in 2023. And if you compare that to 2019, where there was $9 billion of funding, that's a substantial drop over the last kind of four or five years. And really what we saw was that there was that initial drop in 2020, but then there was a substantial recovery in 2021. But since then, funding levels have really dropped consistently every year. And today, funding is 70% below 2019 levels. Wow, that's a very big slowdown. And that comes from our database. Tell us a little bit more about how you actually collected that data, Pranavi. Yeah, so it is scraped off Crunchbase and um, collectively as a team, We've really done the hard yards and gone through Crunchbase and sub-segmented companies by travel, by sector, by region, and done that across um, kind of 10, 20 years. So it's a substantial database and it's proprietary work. I don't really see this kind of work elsewhere. So definitely do check that report out for kind of more detailed analysis. And, you know, we've got like 20 charts in there. So 20 plus charts, I think. So, yeah, do check it out. And, and Justin, are you, so that's from the, the database, crunch-based perspective. In your reporting, are do you, are you seeing a similar slowdown? Is this something that you, you're sensing in the industry? Yeah, as you mentioned, I do uh, every week, every Friday, I do a, a roundup of travel-related startups that have raised money, um, that have announced raises that week. And every time, basically, a startup raises money for the past, basically, since I started in late 2022, um, there's there's some mention of it being a tough funding environment. Everybody says that the investors say that, um, but yeah, and I think that's that's what ended up leading to yeah a much lower level last year. I think it's I think the dollar amount is probably will be a little higher this year, and I think Pranavi will go into that a bit more. But yeah, I I think my reporting is consistent. So, I mean, you hear, we see the numbers, you hear from your sources, it's a tough funded environment. What, what do we think is, is, is causing that? I mean, um, I'm going to ask the same question to both of you, but Pranavi, what, what do you think is causing this, this slowdown? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's clearly been a tough couple of years for the travel venture capital market. And like I said, up top, though, there was that initial rebound in 2021 and 2022, in those two years, the travel market still lagged the overall VC market. But I think today what we're seeing is that, that the decline that we're seeing is not just specific to the travel industry. In 2022 and 2023, the travel VC market has actually been down in line with the overall market. So kind of venture capital investment in general is down across 
most sectors. Um, and that's really due to, you know, that's really due to macroeconomic factors, as high interest rates, high inflation, macro uncertainty, pretty volatile valuation levels. So I think today what we're seeing, it's not just specific to the travel industry. It's something across across the whole board. So, that, I mean, that kind of takes some of the responsibility away from the travel industry. And maybe that's right. I'm, I'm a couple of minutes into recording my first podcast without Sarah, and we're already talking about the Federal Reserve. So things are things are going <laughs> down a rabbit hole. But I mean, you, you, it's kind of interesting that you said, so you said basically, this is a trend that we're seeing across the entire industry. So higher interest rates, tighter monetary environment. It's, it's a hard, so it's a tougher funded environment for everyone across the board. And travel has just taken its fair share of that hit is sort of your perspective. Um, well, actually, if you look at, yes, the decline in 2023 is similar, kind of 35, 40% on a year on year basis, but the overall VC market is only down 5% below 2019, whilst travel VC market is down 70%. So there is still a long way to go before we hit that recovery in travel. Um, so it's not exactly apples to apples, for sure. Okay. And Justin, what do, what do you think? Do you think there's a reason when you hear from your report and why, what makes the funded environment so tough for travel? Yeah, I think it's sort of the multiple um, macro issues that Pranavi mentioned. And what I've heard from like investors and startups that are looking to, or that are trying to fundraise. So during the pandemic or like during like 2021, that that time, it was easier for startups with maybe not a super solid business plan to raise money. And I mean, that was because, you know, the world was shut down. If you're a travel company, you can't necessarily show that you're making revenue from travelers because there were no travelers at that time. So a lot of companies raised money. And then once the pandemic ended, they they're realizing that maybe their business models weren't really panning out as well as they thought. And so they were, they're running out of money. So they go and return to venture capital firms and try to raise more money and they're not able to. I mean, that's led to some shutdowns. Um, it's led, it's leading to a lot of acquisitions this year, quite a lot of like acqui hires as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and yeah, I mean, part of the reason to, for, for venture capital firms, like because of the trouble raising money, like they're not able to raise money themselves for their funds. Yeah. And so then like older funds are having to spread more money over a longer period of time. And so there's just less money to give out. And so the firms want to make sure that if they're investing, they want to make sure that it's a good business model so that they're more likely to get a return later. So travel venture capital explains the state of the economy almost, right? Because like, I, I liked your point, Justin, about talking about venture capitalists don't just have piles of money. They've right. got to go out and get those money from what they call their limited partners, LPs. They, so the venture capitalists have to raise money. Like everyone talks about raising money from VCs, but actually the VCs themselves also need to raise money True. from their investors. And as interest rates go higher, as it's easier to make a return in the S&P 500, as people are speculating less, and also as some of these venture capital funds have not paid out such strong returns in the past couple of years, it's um, it's getting harder for the VCs to raise money and therefore it's harder for the VCs to distribute money, which is sort of ties back to your point about, about in how interest rates, that tiny little number means so much for, for all this stuff, right? Right. I guess I'll... I'll add here a little bit. Um, so we had a look at interest rates as well. And there's actually a very good correlation between interest rates and the amount of VC investment into travel companies in the US. Um, and actually, we kind of, you know, if you look at the numbers, crunch numbers, you can see that as there are further cuts to the interest rate, which I think we can expect into 2024 and 2025, I know the Fed just said that they're going to keep it the same for a little bit, but I think we can expect cuts into 2025. Um, the numbers kind of show that for every 0.1% decrease in the interest rate, in the US interest rate, could potentially add $15 million of VC funding into US travel companies. So a little reason to be a bit optimistic as we go into next year. I, it's so funny because these things feel so disconnected, but 
they are, they really are connected. Like the price you pay for eggs at the grocery store, the price of eggs is one of my favorite topics to talk about with Sarah in this <laughs> podcast. We're talking about all inclusive buffets matters for inflation. The inflation matters for the fed. The fed matters for interest rates, which in turn matters for how LPs raise, want to give money to venture capitalists, which in turn matters for how venture capitalists give out money, which in turn matters for travel startup and travel innovation. So I think it's crazy to see it all come together. Let, let's keep moving. But I just want to ask that your, the data shows that there was a huge amount of venture capital invested in 2021. So we had that big, you know, 2020 hit, everyone shut down. No one would touch travel with a 10 foot full pole. And then venture capital almost doubled, I think nearly $8 billion invested in 2021, almost the same amount as 2019. Is part of what we're seeing just hangover from that? Like, did all the good companies that needed to raise money raise money in 2021 and now there's no need? Like from a we're talking about supply side of where the money's coming from, but are are just are the good com did the good companies get funded in 2021? Do you think that that's possible? What do you think, Justin? I think some good companies got funded, but I think and and during that year specifically, a lot of not good companies got funded as well. And <laughs> some of those not good companies are now gone. So part of it is also these venture capitalists were sitting at home with the rest of us, dreaming of their revenge travel trips, and then that dream and translated to invest in, and then they got burnt a little bit. And now they're, they're you know. Yeah, I think so. Like sometimes a startup maybe raised money, too much money, or they raised money, but the, the business model wasn't probably going to re generate tons of revenue anyway. Um, so like one, one example is Hago, which we actually had them on stage. Mm -hmm. It was like a virtual travel platform. They created this. I actually, I interviewed the CEO of Hago. I, okay, I conducted yeah. that interview on stage. I thought it was, a. we can talk more. I thought it was a great business, but yeah, you're, it didn't, didn't make it right. Yeah. It just, yeah. And he was, I mean, he seemed like a smart guy and he was, um, trying to take advantage of the opportunity. And that's what you have to do as a startup founder. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, af you know, after people could start actually traveling again, it just the virtual travel for that specific company, um, because it was, I think it was straight to, it was like B to C. Um, yeah, it was like a live streaming platform for tour guides to conduct tours virtually. Right. And I, yeah, I think maybe once the world reopened, your point is that it's a little tough to, to compete with a real thing. Yeah, and they raised, I think they raised, I believe it was 25 million. That's a lot of money to raise for, you know, such a, a young startup and a new idea um, with a business model that just didn't pan out after the pandemic. Yeah. So so this raises a great point then. One of the things we're seeing, and I'm going to ask you to talk about this front of you, is that, so maybe VCs are kind of were burnt by giving a large amount of capital to very early stage young companies, kind of pre-revenue companies. I probably, I think you're seeing a, the kind of the swing back in your data. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So what we saw in 2021, 2022 was that there was this surge in funding for early stage startups, but now kind of in the last couple of years in line with that struggling kind of sluggish VC environment that we're in high interest rates as we've already discussed we are seeing that shift towards late stage deals for more mature companies um, and you know if you kind of look at the data in 2023 there was a drop in funding across every deal stage besides the late stage series F funding round so that really goes to show that, you know, in today's environment, when investors did want to invest more money, it was in those safe, mature companies. And I think Get Your Guide is one company that really led that Series F funding round mm -hmm. in 2023, a very mature company valued at more than a billion, billion dollars. So it's those safe, mature companies that um, investors are really flocking to. Yeah, that kind of, I mean, the, even the idea of a Series F, I think a decade ago, had you talked to a VC about a Series F, they would have said, uh, it's called an IPO. But nowadays, right. we're seeing more and more companies raise these late stage growth capital rounds. That's a trend we've been seeing for a while, but it's interesting to see the return to the Series F as I think VCs kind of maybe seek some shelter from that post-pandemic, I won't call it a blow up, but maybe we call it a blow up that, that, that Justin was sort of describing. It's interesting to see the trends and the reporting come together with the data and we say, oh, 
people got burnt during the pandemic. Now they're going for safer later stage Series F. That's an interesting trend. Well, there. it's like a, I think it's like a cycle, like most things, right? Um, you kind of mentioned IPOs, and a lot of companies have wanted to IPO in the last couple of years, but they haven't because it just hasn't been the right time to do it. Valuations haven't really panned out as they want to do it. The stock market has not exactly been as healthy, um, so they rely on VC funding, perhaps. But then, as as that kind of inverses again. You know, we'll see we'll see that cycle inverse again um, as we go into the next few years. So we've talked about the overall trend. We've talked about the stage of the company. One of the things we haven't really touched on is just how much money is being invested, right? You can have a very late stage, high value company and actually not put in that much money or vice versa. You can you can have a very large round. So what are we seeing with uh, round sizes in, in this current fundraising environment? Yeah, I think what we saw generally over the last kind of decade kind of 2012 to 2021 that the deal size has generally increased in that kind of long period but over the last couple of years deals have gotten smaller um so that average deal size has kind of dropped from 10 million um in 2021 to less than 5 million today so it's kind of halved in that time but you know i think we can be a little bit optimistic for 2024 i think based on preliminary data and our own estimates, we've seen that I think what we will see is that that overall VC amount, that dollar raised will increase. Um, but it, it won't be because there are more deals, it'll be because the deal size is going to increase over the next few years. Um, so that's kind of what that's kind of the trend that we're seeing. Justin, what do you, you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen there be more of a shift this year from like toward more large raises and there are a lot quite a few very small raises like three and four million maybe not so much in the middle like the, the mid-tier um, mm-hmm. but one one interesting stat that i've pulled just from my the data that i've put together from my reporting so so through june so far in uh 2024 there have been I've reported on about 20 companies that have raised at least 50 million and 12 companies that have raised at least 100 million. So this same time last year, there were five that had raised at least 50 million and there were only two that had raised at least 100 million. So, I mean, that's quite a lot. It's quite a big difference. I mean, we're just six months in. That's quite a big difference in the number of large fundraisers. Um, but then, yeah, I, as I mentioned, I've, I've seen a lot of small ones. I mean, I was, I was just looking through it. the last roundup that I did, there were 17 startups on it and there, almost all of them were less than 10 million. I think only one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, five of them were, um, above 10 million. So we're seeing this. That's so interesting. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense with a with a move towards those series apps is that you have a couple of large monster rounds and then a lot of little small early stage rounds that are, are maybe more traditional. I mean, again, traditionally, a 25 million series A or series B was is not how this business ran. So maybe we're seeing a return towards a little more normality as as interest rates normalize. Uh, you know, one other interesting topic that I think we should talk about because we've been talking about the Fed, we've been talking about uh, fundraising. We've been very US centric, though, in this conversation so far. And that's an easy, and Prana in London, but that's a very easy bias for myself and Justin to have. But that's not true. Travel is a global industry. Venture capital is a global industry. And I mean, historically, we have seen a huge amount of venture capital fundraising in the travel sector come outside of the US. There was a while where China was the number one market for venture capital and, tra- and travel. What's the update? I mean, back to you, Pranavi, on this one. What what did you see as you as you refresh this data? Yeah, I think we're seeing kind of two things. Firstly, that there is an increased fragmentation. And secondly, that there is a shift eastward within the kind of list of top 10 countries that are investing the most in travel venture capital. So in terms of the fragmentation, for example, in 2021, um, the top 10 countries held like 90% share of the total global travel VC market. And in 2023, they held 85% share. So it's becoming a little bit more fragmented, that kind of 
tail is becoming there's that, that there's becoming a longer tail of smaller countries who are now investing more in VC. Um, and we're also seeing more companies from the Middle East and Asia also investing. Um, and actually, South America and the Middle East saw some of the biggest kind of growth figures in 2023 versus 2022. And also in, in Asia, I mean, you've got some some standout companies like Kluke, which is a tools and experiences OTA we've already discussed. You had Huang Bache. I think I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, that was a <laughs> that was a Chinese travel booking platform. We had some kind of branded um, ownership, hotel ownership companies in, in India. So we're really seeing that kind of shift eastward and an increased fragmentation. Okay, so that's sort of the macro trends, what we just covered. So travel venture capital at a, a decade low, uh, partially that's just the macro environment, but partially it's, it's changes in how travel itself, there was a huge glut of venture capital invested in 2021. Some of those companies are struggling. And as a result, we're seeing a shift towards later stage deal making. We're also seeing greater geographical diversification. That's the big picture view. But stick around for the second half of the podcast as we transition from macro to a little more micro. We're going to talk about some specific sectors and businesses that are raising interest, that are raising money and that we find really interesting. And we're going to have some fun conversations about those. So stick around and we'll join you after the break. All right. And welcome back to the Skiff Travel Podcast. The topic today is venture capital in the travel industry. As a reminder, we're still joined by Pranavi Agarwal, Senior Research Analyst, and Justin Dawes, Travel Tech Reporter. We've been covering the macro landscape and the decade low amount of venture capital raised in travel. But now we're going to talk some specifics and get into the details of exactly what kind of companies are raising and what kind of sectors. I always think this is a fun conversation because where venture capitalists are placing their bets sort of gives us a view into how these technologists, many of them, think about innovation and the future of travel. So let's just jump right into it. In 2023, it's a tough fundraising environment, but in that tough environment, what are the most exciting sectors and the sectors that are most able to raise capital? Pranavi, what do you think? Yeah, so there was an overall decline in 2023, um, but we can see that there were pockets of growth within some key areas of investor interest. So those were tools and activities, so the experiences space, AI, which is of no surprise, I guess, hotels, and also hospitality employment, which is a bit of a hot topic in, in hotels at the moment, too. I mean, let's talk about those. Let's start, I mean, let's, let's talk about them. We can kind of do it in that order. We can start with tours and experiences. This is a, a huge area of interest to, to many in travel, to skip. And I think a lot of people, the narrative is that they see this as the last great offline sector. So we're talking about book and date tours. In some cases, we're talking about book and multi-day tours, uh, tools, companies, startups in that space. What, let, let's get a little more into detail. What kind of companies are raising money in tours and experiences? Yeah, experiences, it's the last frontier of travel. It's a very opportunistic market. Um, and really, the two companies that really stand out are Kluke in Asia and Get Your Guide in, in Europe. So a lot of companies in this space are still private. Um, there are only a few public companies in the space, like Viator, which, are, which is owned by TripAdvisor, and Musement, which is owned by TUI. But the two others are Get Your Guide and Kluke, and they're valued at you know more than a billion dollars. Um, and I think they've raised... Um, close to a billion dollars of, of funding as well. Um, and they were actually the two most funded companies in, in 2023. So really seeing that shift towards tours and experiences. Um, so kind of just to kind of just to put that into context, you know, in 2020, we saw that it was companies in the short term rental sector, which really dominated VC funding. So companies like Sonder and Involve. And, you know, that's in line with that boom in demand we saw for short term rentals during the pandemic. But it's but it's really shifted to its experiences, um, which is which has become a very kind of um, attractive market. And it's it's really the hottest market in, in travel today. Yeah, I wonder how much of that is also like survivorship bias, too, because those hot sectors that you talked about, like 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 um, short term rental, you had Vacasa, you had Sonder, you had Airbnb. I remember writing these reports. They would always be number one in terms of venture capital. Those are all now public companies. And so they don't need venture capital money anymore. I mean, they might actually all can decide they might need some capital in the future, but those companies are now have exited and they've had some, in Airbnb's case, a very, very successful exit. And in <laughs> Sonder and Vacasa's case, a less successful, and in Sparato's case, a less successful 
exit. And so it, it's just interesting to see that these were the two ten, in my opinion, some of the two big tentpole sectors where you were building huge platforms, you were trying to create scale. And more importantly, many of them sold themselves as tech companies, which really appeals to that venture capital mindset. And now the, the, the short term rental ones have come public, that cycle is kind of fully completed its natural life cycle, so to speak, whereas tours and experiences very much still building and still raising, right? So, so do you think that do you think that we can learn from what's happened in short term rentals? I mean, there are a lot of private companies and experiences, like you said, it's still very much offline as well. Do you think we're going to see the same boom and bust in experiences as we saw in short term rentals? It's a great question. I, I think one of there's two lessons there in my mind, you're kind of throwing it back at me, but I, I love that is that one was the vehicle chosen that, you know, the short term rental turned out to be the travel the poster child within the travel sector for those SPACs, those special purpose acquisition corps. That turned out to be a very bad vehicle, turned out to be a, <laughs> back to interest rates, kind of a bit of a zero interest rate phenomenon. And I think those were companies that quite frankly, were not fully ready to go public. They were pre-profitable. They were going public in this very hyped up way, in this way that in some ways allowed them to, I won't say skirt, it was all legal, but had less SEC scrutiny over their financial statements. It was at a time of a really high interest in investing and trading and financialization. It was crypto and all that stuff. So I think we learned some lessons from that, which is to say, don't go public before you're ready. Don't choose the wrong vehicle to go public. There are real benefits to taking a large company IPO at scale with institutional investors with profitability. It does, however, raise some challenges to Klug and get your guide. I'm not intimately familiar with their financial statements, but if how long can you wait if you're not ready to go public? They're raising Series Fs. They're the tent poles of the tourism experiences venture fundraising. I mean, you could raise a G, but can you raise a, you know, how many many letters of the alphabet can you really raise at a certain point? So I think it it's an interesting question. I don't I haven't seen like the financials for Klug, et cetera, either. But one like one thought that I have is the short term rental industry, like Airbnbs, for example, I mean, it's it's compared to the tours and experiences industry, it's fairly new, like it's not brand new, but it's not as mm -hmm. I mean, tours and experiences This has been happening for decades and decades, right? I mean, longer than that, probably. Um, you can make so, an argument for centuries. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But um like I think a lot of like these companies are sort of they're trying to bring those tour companies into the 21st century and so they're sort of like they're not building an industry from scratch they're sort of taking an industry and trying to just make it better and that's I think I, that might be a key difference that's a great distinction right whereas Airbnb, I mean, arguably, again, short term rentals have existed, but the peer to peer model of Airbnb, right. arguably, they kind of created that category. There are plenty in the short term rental sector that would bite my head off for right. saying that, but I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, whereas you're right, like the OTA business model of I'm going to sell travel products online exists. The tour operator industry certainly exists. And so the argument, you know, you're right. I mean, I think many of them would say, look, we are just building an Expedia for this market. I, I think we're, we're making, we get too off topic, but probably you might even disagree with it. There are differences. There are differences to the commission structure and to the inventory in many ways, similar to short term rentals, where there are, it's, it's been hard to build. The commissions are just not as great in the tourism experiences sector as they are in the hotel sector. That's just the facts. Right. Um, so there are some, it's, yeah, it's an interesting mix, right? I'm not sure I agree with that actually because um it I think I think in the hotels online in the OTA hotel space it's the commissions range is much broader so um you can pay like 40% commission if you want to be at the top of booking.com's site um whilst in experiences it tends to be pretty even around 20 25% but if you wanted to you could also pay just 15% 20% um, in, in hotels, even, yeah, yeah around 15%. Um, but I think, I think just kind of looping back to what Justin was saying, kind of comparing short-term rentals to experiences, Airbnb is very much the leader in short-term rentals. Um, 
I think it's much easier to build an online brand presence with short-term rentals because it's something that you would book before you travel. It's something you'd book online. But experiences is something that a large proportion of of, the, of those bookings are done in destination. Um, and I think it means that we're going to see more regional leaders rather than an overall dominant market leader like Airbnb in, in, in short-term rentals. So I think, I think maybe I'm not phrasing this perhaps so well, but I feel like the short, the operators in experiences are more serious rather. I can't see them going via SPACs and kind of these short term um, tools to kind of get a lot of funding or IPO. I think, I think perhaps there, there's, there's a little bit more to play and there's a little bit more to go for whilst who can compete with Airbnb, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly some are trying, but it, it's, They've struggled to compete with Airbnb. Well, let's 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 let me try and build in a little bit of a segue here. Tell the audience a bit of what I'm doing. But one of the key challenges with tours and experiences is the curation aspect of it. There's so many different niche individual aspects. And one of the great ways to solve with curation and recommendation and personalization is uh, is artificial intelligence. And now um, maybe a bit of a contrived segue, but that's the other topic we mentioned. Let, let's move on and let's talk about AI. I mean, this is the hottest sector in the world right now. It is almost single-handedly supporting venture capital uh, broadly. What is happening with venture investment in AI-focused startups in the travel industry? Yeah, I, I can kick it off here. So, um, so yeah, we are seeing some increased investment in AI and data and automation, that kind of kind of thematic bucket. Um, but I think there are some nuances to point out here. Um, and we had some venture capital investors speak at our data and AI summit um, back in June. And, you know, they were saying that we're not investing in AI for the sake of AI, but they're rather right. looking for companies that can use the best of AI. And those are the companies that will be the highest quality companies, the ones that are integrating AI kind of most efficiently already into their existing operations. So. So yes, AI is seeing that kind of boom and you're seeing some more investment in AI, but I don't think that we will see more investment in AI in itself going forward. We'll rather see funding into companies that have integrated AI the most efficiently. I think that's true. I mean, I'll give one example of um, Canary Technologies. It's a hotel tech uh, company that's that just raised $50 million and um it's they they focus sort of like on guest management at hotels. They have an AI tool as part of the package of their software, but it's not like it's an AI company. I mean, I guess it is, but it's not. There's more to it than that. It's they have so a business I'm, and they're injecting AI into it. I'll, I'll admit that I'm surprised to hear both of you saying this, and you're closer to the data and the stories than I am. But I sort of thought the trend was that everyone was just. Uh, opening up a, a an off the shelf chat GPT model, putting a chat on their product, and raising money as an AI backed startup, and saying we're an AI company now. Is that not what we're seeing? Are we are we are I we seeing more say responsibility that. than that? You I think there's a lot of hi- like a lot of hype around it, and like there's a lot of maybe marketing from companies who say, oh look, we're we're in, you know we have this AI thing, and it's so cool. Usually, it's not that cool. Um, just to be frank. But uh, I mean, I've only, I've really only seen a couple of small fundraises for from companies that say, "Oh, we're like an AI trip planner," or like we're an AI company. Like if some of the sometimes they do get funding, but like from what I've seen, it's like three million, two million. You have to have a good business model, and I mean, re- whether you have AI or not, and having AI doesn't mean that you have a good business model. I'll add one of the, so one of the other sectors we saw an increase in was hospitality employment. And that was really led by InstaWork. So InstaWork, for those of you who might know, it, it offers kind of on-demand staffing and it also offers recruitment service for, um, for people in the hospitality business. So InstaWork weren't going to raise any money. So they'd raised about 8 million in 2022. But then in 2023, they decided to raise 60 million. So that's a big jump uh, within a year. And that was because they got really excited about AI and they were going to use that funding money to implement AI and machine learning 
into into its operations. So I think it's kind of going to show that if you are going to raise money, it is to integrate AI into your business rather than I'm going to invest into an AI company in itself. But it's interesting that both of you highlighted the operational side of this. So I was thinking, you know, I think many of our listeners might be thinking AI trip plan and startups or AI this or AI that, but what we're, and we, we heard this at the data and AI summit as well. What we're seeing actually is a lot of AI use cases and saying, you know, labor, and you brought up this labor point, labor is suck. Labor, hiring, paying people and training people is probably, I don't think it's too far to say the single biggest problem facing the travel industry today. And there's, there's two ways to do it. And there's hire different people, or hire, hire better, or train your people better or replace them just to say it bluntly. And, and there's a role for maybe AI and automation and all of those. And that's, that's a trend that we're seeing, Pranavi. I think any company that's trying to increase its efficiency and be, uh, yeah, be more efficient in its processes are, is seeing, is see is funding, is, is raising more funding. So Justin, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, but companies like property tech management and, kind of corporate corporate expense management, like companies like Muse and Navan, these companies are raising a lot of money and are in demand because they're they're offering exactly that, right? They're offering other companies the opportunity to be more efficient in their in their processes. And those are the companies that are really leading funding. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, I can I can share a few examples if you want. Please, yeah, please do. Yeah. Um I mean yeah, as Marvi said, yeah, Muse is one that they keep raising money they just raised 110 million earlier this year and i think yeah before that they had raised 185 um just you know not too long before that um yeah that's a hotel tech like a property management system for hotels and again yeah it's about like that type of tech has really taken off post pandemic because of the because hotels just need to be more efficient especially with not as many staff Travel Perk is yeah one that she mentioned. They just raised. Um, I uh, don't have how much they raised. I lost that, but yeah, I mean they just raised a lot of money. Um, it's corporate, yeah, corporate travel, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's 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 an interesting point, and I, I think what's also important is that these are all platforms. Like I was going back to your earlier conversation. About, Where's the AI trip planners? Where are the AI trip planners? I just got an email about AI trip planners today. And I think it's interesting. The AI tools are maybe being built as platforms or integrated into platforms. We had Microsoft speak at our data and AI summit. Microsoft is the largest investor in open AI. They are investing billions and billions and billions of corporate venture capital in this space, but they're not a travel company, obviously, right? But they have a very large travel division and they're looking for travel use cases. And you're seeing Muse integrate AI, they're a platform, they're working across a large sector of the industry. So it is interesting to see that we see AI as a trend, but that it's maybe not um, the way it's being used is maybe counterintuitively, not how you would have thought it was going to be used um, a year ago, perhaps. I think, I think a good way to kind of think about it is that AI companies aren't going to raise a lot of VC funding, but they are going to be acquired. And there's going to be a lot of mm. M&A activity in that space. And that's and that's how they're going to make money. They're going to sell it to a travel company that needs that AI, but they're not going to, they're not going to be another Microsoft, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's really, I think, where the difference is. Yeah, and it's it maybe, and it's also in that maybe, I won't call all of them an aqua hire, but maybe it's in that space of saying, we've got this technology, we're not going to build the next Microsoft in the travel industry, but we need expertise in how to take these broad platforms and add domain specific knowledge around the travel industry, not even probably around travel, probably around specific sectors of, of how can I apply AI into corporate travel or into airlines or into whatever. Um, that expertise around the integration may be similar to how like a CRM software is this broad category, but you need to have domain specific knowledge. Um, as you're talking about, um, you know, M&A and exits, uh, maybe let's, let's play a couple of fun games as we come to the end of our time together a couple of lightning round questions uh and i've got i've got really two lightning rounds for you are there any um are there any big exits or ipos that you think we are overdue for i mean i'm not no one's going to hold you to this just just <laughs> you think there's any companies that we we will finally see any of these big series f or, or any company that you think are going to have a big acquisition or a big ipo in the next year what do you think yeah um 
I mean, we talked about a little bit about Get Your Guide and Kluke. I think they will IPO at some point. I don't think it'll be in 2024. Maybe in 25, that'll be huge, really exciting for us at Skiff to cover. But we're already seeing a little bit of activity this year in India, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah. India obviously is seeing this huge surge in demand for travel, um, you know, outbound travel, but also domestic travel. And we're also seeing that being reflected in the IPO market. So recently, Ixigo IPO, which is in Indian OTA. Um, and then there are some other companies which have been talking about IPO for a long time. So, of course, OYO. Um, you know, I think I think they said they wanted to raise about a billion dollars and that's dropped to kind of 500, 600 million. So, I mean, valuations have dropped even for Ixigo. I think that valuation halved how much they were willing to raise. But this is the time they said this is the time to raise to, 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 to IPO. This is the time to go for it. India is having its kind of moment in the sun so we should really just you know go for it another one is Leela hotels i think which is yeah talked a little bit about ipoing so luxury luxury hotel market and luxury travel is really also having its kind of moment in the sun um you also, so had, the, think, yeah, you also those... had the, the tbo ipo which was oh, yes. travel tech in india that was a very big ipo as well so i think your point is and you said this earlier about regional we often talk about a window an ipo window and maybe it's not fully open in the u.s but it you raise a great point, Pranik. The, the IPO window feels very oh, starting to open, at least in India. I, I can't. Oyo is a fan favorite of mine. I think people know this. You know this, Pranavi, but I would love to see Oyo IPO. Yeah, definitely. I think that'll be great for us. It's gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another. Yeah. I mean, Navan is one. Um, Ooh, yeah. That you know they've been talking about. Actually, and Guesty is another. They they were at the short term rental summit in. I wrote a story based on his talk. Um, he was mm -hmm. talking about an IPO. Um, I'm wondering about, and I have no idea, but I'm wondering about Travel Perk as well. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, I don't, I, Navan, <laughs> and, Navan and Guesty, I mean, they've built some really in, incredible and large businesses there. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not as sure about, I don't know, I'll admit I don't know Travel Perk as well, but I think you're right. These are, these are it's a great list. These are the candidates. Uh, full disclosure for listeners in the moment, right? These are not, these are, these are fun. This is the lightning round. This is not <laughs> full predictions, but um, yeah, I mean, I think all of those are due for, for something, right? I mean, yeah, travel perk. I'm just seeing now it, it's a, it's a unicorn at this point. It was, they, they raised 104 million um, in January at a valuation of 1.4 billion. That's, that's and surely, it. And surely these investors, I mean, like Nirvana's raised, like a billion in equity and I think another billion in debt financing. I mean, the, surely these investors are desperate for an exit. It's been like, it's been like four years since COVID, right? So surely there's that pressure on them to do this. And as, as the markets are improving, we should see this pretty, pretty soon, I think in, in the first half of 2025 even. Yeah. Or some sort of a secondary exit to a private equity or, or some sort of a, right. something, right? I think there has to be some sort of secondary liquidity event for some of these earlier investors, I think for sure. Uh, all right. And let, let's, as we come up in time, let's do our, our final lightning round of this podcast. And it's one of my favorite topics. And when we talk about venture capital, it's just moonshots, just fun ideas. These, I, we're not going to hold you to them again. These businesses don't have to survive. Just what do you think? And we're going to start with you on this one, Justin. What are just some fun uh, moonshot uh, startup ideas that, that you think get you excited or that you just think are interesting? Um. Well, I covered one um, a couple of years ago. It's based in New York City. And, you know, we have like, like essentially a short-term rental ban in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so this company, it's called Ohana, and they're trying to take advantage of like that middle market in between, basically between 30 days and like nine months. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that, that one got a lot of um, attention. There's another one I covered recently it's called directo it's they just raised one million and they it's basically an extension a, a chrome extension and it reads the so if you're on airbnb or booking.com it it reads the photo like it recognizes the photo and it sort of automatically searches the web and looks for a direct looks for a website where you can make a direct booking and then it tells you how much money you would save uh if you made a direct booking so that's, I mean, that's kind of an interesting one. It uses like 
AI I image recognition. Part of the origin story for OTA Insight built a similar, I could be wrong, don't quote me on this, could, built a similar tool in hotels. So certainly we've seen successful businesses. OTA Insight is now Lighthouse. We've seen successful businesses built off of something as simple as a, as a browser app. So there's definitely potential there. Mm. Um, what about you, Pranavi? What do you think? Moonshots. Yeah, perhaps a, this is a little bit blue sky thinking, but I think kind of any company which reduces friction and kind of pain points in a consumer's journey, both in booking a trip, but also being on the trip itself. And of course, you know, companies like Hopper have really, um, have really stood out when it comes to this. And they also raised a little bit of money, I think, in 2022. But yeah, I think it ultimately comes down to data and, and AI, you know, um, a company um, which a data company that perhaps can is integrated across all parts of your life kind of tells you perhaps before you leave your house for the airport, if there's a lot of traffic or if your flight is delayed. And if that is the case, then they can suggest, you know, you book the train instead of take a car to the airport or they'll book you that lounge lounge access, that kind of company, which simplifies your life and makes makes it just easier for a consumer. I think companies like that really, really excite me. Um, and, you know, con the connected trip is the holy grail of travel, um, but perhaps data is the way to really, really tap into that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly, yeah, the, uh, the, the true connected trip, which we have, we've yet to see emerge. I think that that's a big, that's a, a big business when someone cracks that, you know what, you know what mine is? I I'm, I'm a big fan. Have you guys heard of this company called boom supersonic? They're trying no. to push. Okay. Sounds interesting. The, the whole airline weekly team is going to, you know, roll their eyes at this thing, but it's this company trying to build a new supersonic aircraft. And so they're, 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 they're venture back. They've raised a bunch of money and they're trying to build a, 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 a new, basically a modern Concorde, uh, bring back uh, supersonic travel. They've signed a, a partnership with United Airlines. They're supposedly testing some stuff. The whenever I talk to, I won't say who, but some some people in the industry, they always say this company is kind of it's a moonshot. It's not real. Apparently, they don't even have an engine. And I, I would imagine I'm not an engineer, but I would imagine that an important part of going supersonic is the engine that you use to do so. So it may turn out to be a big flash in the pan. But for whatever reason, I just always get excited about the idea of supersonic aircraft. And no matter how crazy it sounds, I know there's a couple startups out there out there pursuing it. That would be incredible. Maybe in the next generation, maybe there will be supersonic travel. Maybe. Let, let's hope it comes yeah. back. But that, that's the dream of venture capital is that in the next generation, you know, the, the landscape looks different. You have the connected trip. Um, you know, you have the supersonic trip. You have you have all these these cool new ideas to come. Um, yeah. Flying that. taxis too. A lot of money. Oh, yeah. Into flying taxis. I'm, I, I want to. I want to take one. I want to. I want to use one. Some of those are are public SPACs now too. So they're public yeah, a lot companies. Of them. Those ideas always get me excited. I know that they're maybe not the future of um, true main like fly, maybe flying taxis will not be true mainstream mass transit. Maybe they're not going right. to replace trains. I already see the hate comments coming in. Trains, <laughs> trains, don't you get it? It's eco trains, but um, <laughs> um, I want to see how that goes. Well, look, if you have any questions about any of the companies you mentioned, if you've got a question about where you, if you've got ideas or thoughts about where you think the future of the travel industry is going, we want to hear from you. You can reach out to us. We have an inbox now. That's podcasts at skiff.com. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation with both of you. Pranavi, Justin, thanks so much for coming on the podcast to talk about, about the future of travel and venture capital and travel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank thanks you so much. much. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to the Skiff Travel Podcast. Wherever you're listening, please make sure to subscribe. If you like what you're hearing, rate us five stars or leave us a positive review. It really helps get the word out about us, our podcast, and make sure that we can still continue to bring it to you free of charge every week. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell as well. That way you'll know every time we have a new episode.